No story will feel real to readers unless the world in which it takes place feels real. In this video, I wanna show you some examples of a world that feels real and talk about how you can make your settings feel the same way using four different methods. I'm editing my latest novel at the moment and in my last video, I got a comment about one of my settings that really made me think. I'd used this line when I was talking about the island, one of the settings from my book. A breath of humid air crossed Karina's face. And one of my viewers just pointed out to me how that line gave a little bit of life to the environment of the story. So thanks again for your comment, Jason. So this got me thinking about how little details and movements and signs of life in your setting can really make a difference in how alive your world feels to readers. I found a few great examples of this in the book that I've just finished, which is An Ocean of Minutes by TLM, and it's beautifully written. The first example I think we can learn from comes in how she describes the distant view of an oil refinery in this half abandoned city. From afar, the refinery looked like someone had punctured the coast with a hundred different needles. Sewing needles, knitting needles, spindles, syringes. There's a lot I like about this, and a lot that I think we can take away to help with our own writing. Firstly, it's a sense of scale. It struck me as interesting how she describes something as vast as towers in an oil refinery by using tiny objects like syringes and needles. It seems like it could have the opposite effect and make the towers seem really tiny, but it doesn't. The nature of the objects that she uses in this description also has the effect of making the world she's created feel imposing and threatening too. All of those sharp points laid out almost like a trap, it's a violent enough image that it expands beyond just the refinery itself. Its influence characterises the entire surrounding area in which the main character Polly finds herself as unpleasant and dangerous, which it is. It gives the scenery and the setting a feeling and a personality. Often, when I approach a metaphor or a simile in my own writing, my first thoughts are visual. What does this thing look like that I can compare it to? And that can often work just fine. But it's worth thinking about if that comparison works thematically too. For example, if Taylor Lim had compared those towers to uncooked spaghetti, it wouldn't have created the same imposing feeling that carries through to the rest of her world. Try taking an extra step when thinking about similes and metaphors to make sure they fit thematically. Think about what you can compare something to, but also if that contributes to the mood and atmosphere of your story. Sorry, I'm interrupting the main video for a second, but you know, at least it's me and not an ad for Rage Shadow Legends. So if you have a story that you're working on that you wanna to send to journals or to competitions, or if you've just started a novel and you wanna know if you're on the right track, I'm now offering a developmental editing service on my website. I'll take a look at all the obvious stuff, the spelling and grammar, that kind of thing but I'll also look at how the story works as a whole and how I think you can refine it or develop it. Then I'll give you a complete write-up with all of my suggestions and comments and advice. It doesn't matter what level of experience you have, I'll give you some friendly and actionable advice that you can put towards all of your future work as well. There's a QR code on screen and a link in the description if you wanna go and check out prices and that kind of thing. Thank you so much for your patience. Back to the video. One of my favorite ways to bring life into the settings of my stories is to allow something to move in the background just a little bit. I know, I'm always talking about this. A small amount of movement in the background just gives the effect that the world exists beyond the simple viewpoint of your character. And that, I think, just gives the world a bit more depth and makes it feel a bit more real. There's a great example of how simple but effective this can be in an ocean of minutes with this description of an abandoned high rise. A lone, gawky high rise, age spotted and brown, crisscrossed on one side with fire escapes, but gaping open on the other. This height wise hole covered by a flap of plastic that slapped in the wind like a giant skirt. What really made this description come alive for me was that movement, the slapping of the giant skirt. I had all of those other details, of course, the crisscrossing, fire escapes, and the age spotting, but none of those details really brought the picture to life for me until that little bit of movement. Just the movement of some plastic emphasizes how abandoned this place really is, how unattended and uncared for. It's the absence of people demonstrated just by a little bit of movement. It says no one's taking care of this place without saying it. Not to mention the idea of the plastic slapping against the side of the building introduces a little bit of sound as well. Description isn't always visual. You can add depth and richness to your setting using the other senses too. Try making something move in the background to complement all the static details of your setting. A little bit of movement can highlight the parts of your world you want your reader to remember, and a hint of sound can bring some added depth too. What might have struck you about these descriptions so far is that they're all relatively simple really. 
They don't go on for pages and pages and they're not hugely poetic. To me, that's a really important part of making your world feel alive for a reader, giving your description room to breathe. Burying your setting under word after word can really make it feel quite heavy to read, I think. The reader almost has to slow down to process all of this information, or at least I do, it might be different for you. There's a great example of quite literally allowing the world to breathe in this book too. A simple description that allows space for the reader to imagine the scene. Then the road humped up, as if the land were taking a deep breath. Over the ridge came the sea, every wave crested by a tiny sun. This is such a simple image. I love that first bit. I always find a simple simile is really easy for readers to digest. Because it's not jam-packed with words, the language and the sentence feels more open, which perfectly reflects the scene that it's relaying. Not to mention, this personification of the land taking a breath comes as the character is moving out of the threatening city into more open space. Now the description is slower and more open and altogether more calm. Try giving your setting some space to breathe. For a smooth feeling description of open or large scale scenes, keep the language simple and a bit more brief. Saying less slows down the pace and makes the story seem less frantic. I like the mention of light in that last description too, every wave crested by a tiny sun. Descriptions of light or using light is something that I use way too often in my own writing. I end up editing half of them out, but light is a surefire way to bring life into your scenes. It can be a subtle way to illuminate something that you don't want your readers to miss, or it can be just an alternative way to demonstrate the time of day to your reader without being on the nose about it. But Taya Lim uses light in one passage to illuminate the theme of her story, pun intended. And at the same time, she uses it to represent the life and status of her character. Without spoiling anything, the novel's really all about the divide between rich and poor, which is something that perhaps has never been more topical than it is today. And that divide manifests itself as physical locations within the city. There's poor places and rich places. Here's how she describes that situation and her character's place within it using light. After sundown, she could see the glow of the resort on the horizon on the other side of the miles-long midden of broken doors and dirt. She was at the bottom of a moat of darkness, circling a castle of light. Not only is that an effective bit of description, I think, but it's also the life of the character, both her interior state and her exterior environment, represented by different states of light. Light versus dark is one of the oldest descriptors we have for storytelling. It's in every story, it's timeless. And light really is a great tool for writers to use. It can bring a sense of life to any scene or setting, just as an absence of light can take life from it. Try describing a scene using light. Mention how the light falls, how much of it there is, what it's illuminating and what it's not. Light versus dark is a timeless image for good reason. Try relating it to your story. When you're writing a story, it's really easy to think of your setting as this static image, this backdrop, because it makes more sense to think about the movement and the interactions and the actions of your characters. That's hugely important. However, if we leave the setting to just be a curtain hanging at the back of the stage, it can become another of those numerous things that just doesn't quite feel right for a reader. If the background is too flat and too still, then all of the characters and all of the action moving in front of it can start to feel artificial. To avoid that and to instill a little bit of life into your settings, let's recap. Try making sure your comparisons don't just function, they match the setting too. Try making something move in the background. Try keeping the language simple so there's room to breathe. And try describing a scene using light. Obviously you can't use all of these tips in every description you write, but if you're still writing your story, try dotting them around here and there. And if your story's already written, but some of your description needs a little bit more life here and there, try using one of these methods. A setting that's living and moving is one of those things that keeps a story feeling real to a reader and avoids giving them a reason to put the book down. If you're looking for more ways to grab a reader's attention, there's four different methods in this video that are easy to take away and put into practice. As always, thank you so much for watching and happy writing.